Welcome to FYI, the four-year innovation podcast. This show offers an intellectual discussion on technologically enabled disruption, because investing in innovation starts with understanding it. To learn more, visit arc-invest.com. Arc Invest is a registered investment advisor focused on investing in disruptive innovation. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. It does not constitute either explicitly or implicitly any provision of services or products by ARC. All statements made regarding companies or securities are strictly beliefs and points of view held by ARC or podcast guests and are not endorsements or recommendations by ARC to buy, sell, or hold any security. Clients of ARC Investment Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Now I'd like to introduce Brett Winton, our Director of Research. Uh, Brett Winton and I have worked together now uh, for roughly 15 years. Uh, uh, Brett was the lead analyst at, uh, in our uh, strategic change group uh, at our former firm. And uh, I selected him as Director of Research for, for a few reasons. First of all, I saw his talent. Uh, I had been working with him. But second, uh, Brett has, uh, is an, uh, an MIT engineer by training, uh, and that's a very good starting point uh, for what we do. Uh, Brett also, uh, when he got out of MIT, had aspirations to reform the educational system in California and, uh, and started, to, uh, started on that quest and realized that perhaps he'd do better moving into business development at startup companies. So with those three uh, experiences, I couldn't think of a better person to join me and uh, and focus on exclusively on disruptive innovation and the opportunities that it will create uh, and the exponential growth opportunities it will deliver over time. So Brett, uh, take it away. Thanks, Kathy, uh, and hello, everyone. As Kathy said, I'm director of research at ARK Invest. So what does a director of research do? Um, I keep the analysts focused on the time horizon that matters in innovation, which is over the medium and long term. Uh, and so um, our analysts focus at the technology level. Um, we look for convergences. Ultimately, um, I help guide the cost decline in unit economics forecasts that form the body of our work to understand what the addressable markets in these technologies is going to look like in five and 10 years from now. And as Kathy said, uh, within the equity space and particularly within the innovation space, um, the, the long term is the time horizon that matters. And uh, as you'll see, as you as you work through this big ideas deck and um, and as you you hear some of the information we're sharing with you today, um, it really is a unique time in technological economic history. So I'm happy to share with you uh, our big ideas 2022. We put a lot of time and work and effort into it and the analysts have done tremendous work to dimension the opportunities that lie in front of us and uh, the technological capabilities that they'll unveil. Uh, and I'll share that with you now. So uh, one of the things that, that we've, um, noticed in particular over the last six and 12 months is the degree to which the innovations we're focused on are converging. The, the way in which AI is feeding into genome sequencing and, and the, the insights you can get from molecular information, um, the importance of um, uh, blockchains in the consumer space uh, is not something that anybody foresaw um, you know, 24 months ago. And now almost every um, consumer facing company has some kind of NFT strategy, some of which even makes sense. Uh, and, and so um, kind of the convergence of technology is, is, is where a lot of exciting um, opportunities lie, both because there's likely to be more misunderstanding there and you, you can get these compounding effects where you have an S-curve building on top of an S-curve and the overall opportunity set for a set of businesses can amplify. Um, I'm gonna spend a brief moment going over disclosures. Uh, as Kathy said, uh, there's lots of volatility involved in investing in innovation. Uh, 
people often mistake volatility for risk. I think volatility is better understood as uncertainty. The the future, the the set of possibilities that out is out there um, for these uh, innovation platforms and innovation companies is has has a wide air band around it, and that's why it's important to focus on a longer term point of view uh, so that you can get into that upper bound of the air band, or so you can get into an air band that's out far enough that uh, economic value has been demonstrated. Um, there's other risks that you can read about here. Uh, ultimately, the way we think about it is that um, the uh, we're going to make some forward-looking statements, and um, we may be wrong about those forward-looking statements, and there's all kinds of known and unknown risks and uncertainties associated with those. Um, so as I said, so as Kathy said, there are five innovation platforms that we focus on, uh, AI, uh, energy storage or battery technology, uh, blockchain, in particular public blockchains, robotics, and then uh, DNA sequencing, or I think of it as gene read write. And um, this is the composite forecast of the 14 technologies that we focus on and the aggregate market cap appreciation that we anticipate accruing across each of these five technologies. As you can see, the rate of growth is very high. Uh, not only that, this suggests that um, the, the market capitalization attributable to innovation will exceed meaningfully the uh, market cap uh, capitalization attributed to other businesses over the next decade. There was an old saying in, in uh, emerging markets investing where uh, you could see that GDP was going to accrue to the emerging markets. So then you had to deploy assets, uh, your own exposure to the emerging markets to take advantage of that GDP accrual. Uh, and we believe the same is true within innovation. If, if half of market cap is going to be attributed to innovation, uh, then from an um, allocation perspective, you're better off being in front of that wave than waiting for it to occur. Um, so AI, collectively, these five, these five technology platforms, we expect to um, accrue over $200 trillion in value over 10 years. Um, and, uh, and, and in the underlying deck here, there's a lot of detail behind this. And I'll go through a, a little bit of detail on each platform to explain how we derive these values. Um, both in this forecast and in our underwriting of individual securities in our five-year price targeting, we're not assuming that investors are going to play, pay some kind of extra normal uh, amount for the cash flow spilling off these platforms. Instead, you can roughly think about it as defining uh, most of these technologies as being priced as generating a 5% cash flow yield in the out year. Uh, and so uh, in some instances, this is you know, implying a, an extreme multiple compression in the technologies. Though given equity prices today, uh, it's not as true in other instances. Um, so these, this uh, highlights the, the 14 underlying technologies that, that fit under these platforms. So purple is AI, and that comprises cloud computing, Internet of Things, mobile connected devices, and AI itself. Um, blue is the, the um, DNA sequencing space, the genome space, gene editing, gene sequencing, living therapies. Uh, Green is uh, battery technology, including autonomous vehicles. Yellow is blockchain and, and digital wallets. And then red is the robotic space. Uh, and and um, this is also a scoring of the convergence between these technologies that we've done, which illustrates both that um, they each technology is discreetly modelable, but there is also um, important dependencies between the technologies. You, one of the reasons to be um, optimistic about robotaxi and the economic value that robotaxis can deliver is because of the fundamental innovation happening in the AI and neural net space. Over the last um, you know, 24 months, there have been massive breakthroughs in natural language processing, which is a tremendously open-ended problem. Uh, and so it's more likely in our view that then robotaxis will be solved given the, the fundamental capability of the neural nets that support the natural language processing space. Um, and this is how um, kind of a visualization of how the, the um, asset value accrual will break down. Uh, again, you can see that um, each of these technologies against which we have defined a cost decline curve and done unit economics cases for end buyers are um, experiencing steep cost declines. 
They also cut across sectors, which is an important characteristic. And it, we align our research by technology rather than by sector because it helps us to understand the total addressable markets better. Uh, and they're all also platforms of innovation on top of which other technologies can be built. Um, so I'll spend a moment on each technology platform and then move us on to the rest of the show. Uh, within the AI space, we expect that um, artificial intelligence and the associated technologies will yield more than $100 trillion in market capitalization by 2030. Um, there's mobile connected devices here. Uh, that includes expectations for augmented reality headsets uh, and, um, and the constellation of device devices that you wear on your person. And the data feeding off those devices feeds into kind of the AI models that we believe are gonna drive the future of software. Um, cloud computing is um, kind of the infrastructure as a service layer that, that gives us access to a su supercomputer in our pockets from any connected device. Uh, and um, as a response to the demand for AI, we think there's going to be a meaningful increase in, um, in compute hardware spend to support it, uh, exceeding a trillion dollars. Uh, and then Internet of Things is, is fixed connected devices. So the smart speakers, the smart TVs, uh, and you can think of this as this is the, um, the, the, the media retail space that lives inside your home that, that um, allows you to frictionlessly buy things through e-commerce platforms and frictionlessly access media and potentially you know, public blockchain Web3 assets. Uh, and of course, AI itself, and, and this drives a lot of the value accrual expectations here. Uh, the value accrual is predicated on the fact that the advances in AI suggest that um, it's not going to be considered uh, artificial intelligence, but instead augmented intelligence, where every knowledge worker will become more productive. Every software engineer will become more productive. And the um, productivity value that we anticipate spilling off AI will actually meaningfully exceed the, the revenue that AI software companies will capture. Um, and yet still, we believe there's $14 trillion in AI software spend that will uh, uh, occur by 2030, leading to that um, you know, 80 plus trillion dollars in enterprise value. Um, within the battery technology space, this is where we capture both uh, energy storage opportunities as well as uh, autonomous mobility. Uh, there's some nuance. Autonomous mobility and robotaxi in particular, we believe is going to be the most um, economically productivity generating innovation of all time. And, and the, the logic is relatively simple. We spend 700 to 800 billion hours driving a year as amateur drivers. And so if you can displace that at a discount to the economic value of it, uh, people will happily pay uh, to be driven around. And, uh, and you end up with this economic value creation of the freed up time. And this is true of a lot of innovations where you take non-market activity. Here, when I drive around in my car, I'm not getting paid to do so, but I would happily pay another service, inexpensive service to drive me around. And then I could spend that time, um, you know, working, uh, doing modeling or binge watching Narcos on Netflix. And, and any of those acti activities reckon, uh, uh, manifest as, as economic value add, whereas previously those hours driven um, were not economically productive hours by GDP accounting. Uh, on the battery technology side, it's interesting. It seems as if the, the automotive space is being priced as if the pricing structure of selling cars will not transform. Uh, and as if uh, every uh, single competitor is going to trend towards Tesla-like margins on their ability to produce electric vehicles. We think that's probably misguided. Uh, there is, um, it's hard to imagine uh, autonomous mobility services coming into play without dramatically changing uh, the unit cost of a vehicle and the form factors that will be sold into the market. And so uh, tread carefully there. Uh, the, um, within the robotic space, this includes um, 3D printing, where um, you can essentially manufacture any part on demand. You can de-risk supply chains. You can get complexity for free. Uh, and you can deliver um, better performance, particularly within aerospace, on um, on low volume units. Uh, it includes robotics. And there's uh, we have a, a 
back-end weighted expectation for robotics value accrual. It's heavily contingent upon continued advances in neural nets. But just like we think that AI software can, can augment knowledge workers, we think um, robotics within the manufacturing space can become much more flexible and software defined. And, and that would meaningfully increase the productivity of, of the world of built things. And then reusable rockets. And, and it, with reusable rockets, you have um, crossing two orders of magnitude and cost declines of getting things up into orbit. Uh, it seems like the, the most meaningful opportunity here is in, in low Earth orbit um, satellite constellations delivering connectivity. Uh, but it's still in a very early stage as to what's going to be realized with that technology, including potentially hypersonic um, travel around the world uh, and, and transformations in logistics on that basis. Um, in the um, genomic space, um, there is amazing convergence between these technologies. The, the inexpensive gene editing that's been delivered by CRISPR technology um, yields insights and easy experimentation, which then makes the um, sequencing, generating the, the molecular information more valuable, uh, which then allows us to discover um, kind of more uh, diseases and disorders and the, the fundamental molecular basis of them, which um, enables us to deliver, uh, develop and deliver living therapies into the body um, to, to cure them. Uh, and so um, there, this is the technology platform that's in its earliest stages, uh, and it has perhaps the greatest potential for providing benefit to humanity as we are able to um, hopefully eliminate pernicious diseases uh, and understand exactly what they are. Uh, and then finally, within the public blockchain space, then we're going to share a lot of information about blockchains in in the next hour or so. Um, we think that this should best be understood as three concurrent revolutions that have all been catalyzed by the introduction of Bitcoin into the world. There's a money revolution, uh, which Bitcoin is positioned to win. There's a financial revolution, uh, which comprises the um, the DeFi space and, and everything that's happening with smart contracting within the financial ecosystem. And then there's the um, consumer internet revolution, which includes all of the experimentation going on with NFTs uh, and uh, including people buying, you know, digital JPEGs for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, the the other uh, technology that we categorize here that, that's often overlooked is, is digital wallets. And um, here, so you can think of public blockchains as, as kind of tearing apart and remaking the back end of the financial ecosystem. How are assets custodied, kept track of, um, transferred? Um, we believe that digital wallets are um, refiguring the front end of financial ecosystems. The two largest consumer facing financial companies in the US, as we think about it, are not uh, uh, traditional banks, but Venmo and, and the Blocks Cash App. Uh, and um, it's actually hard to imagine that 10 years from now, you will be going into bank branches to conduct financial transactions. We think that model uh, is um, doesn't make sense. Instead, it's likely that uh, these front end digital wallets that can cross sell you into all kinds of financial um, um, services uh, and have very low customer acquisition costs and um, and become increasingly important if you're in a multi-asset world where you're transferring in and out of cryptocurrencies, have almost, um, almost $10 trillion in market capitalization globally that um, they'll occupy. Uh, so that's a, an overview of the technologies that we cover. Um, the uh, the analysts have done incredible work modeling, dimensioning, um, running cost declines on these technologies, uh, and and um, the one of the key characteristics that we believe differentiates us as a research team uh, is that not only are the analysts focused at the technology level, um, but we also try to. Uh, open source our research into the world that then also forces us to be very good at communicating to each other internally about our expectations. And so that the research team can build on each other's work and in an era of convergence in an era where um, kind of batteries and 
AI are a key in both key inputs into enabling robo taxi. Uh, and, and both of those um, kind of expert areas need to reside in a company like Tesla. It's important that you have a batteries analyst that can build on top of the work of an AI analyst and vice versa. And um, the, as a team, I think that we are well positioned both to understand um, where technology is going and to uh, um, to, to appropriately model the, 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 the S curves that can compound on top of S curves as a result of these convergences. Um, so please enjoy the uh, remaining presentations in Big Ideas and please look through the deck and, and I hope to see you on Twitter. ARC believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that ARC believes to be reliable. However, ARC does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from ARC. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on ARC's current views and assumptions, and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements.